All right, so this next lesson is uh, unit one, lesson 15, and we're going to analyze forces in circular motion. So yesterday we looked at centripetal acceleration, but we can apply centripetal acceleration to Newton's second law. Just like we would say the sum of all forces in x equals mass times acceleration in x, and likewise the same thing for y, using this coordinate system, we can also say all the forces which contribute to centripetal force equals mass times centripetal acceleration. So looking at this third one is what we're going to do today. So if we have something undergoing circular motion, I'd always tell you, well, when you're creating your coordinate system, always choose your positive direction to lead to direction of acceleration. Now, in this case, we're moving in a circle. The acceleration is always center-seeking. So what we're going to do is make the direction towards the center of the circle positive. Okay, now there could be a couple examples like this. So let's say, um, let's say we have a ball at the end of a string, and we're whirling it around in a vertical circle like this. We're going to look at two situations. One situation is when it's at the bottom. And the other situation is when it's at the top. So how do we draw free body diagrams from this? Let's look at the bottom. The bottom one obviously has gravity, and it's pointing down, so Fg. And then it has a force of tension up, force of tension. Okay, the top one has both gravity and tension, but in this case, they're both down. Fg and tension. So those are our two different cases there. And so, depending on what the problem is, if the problem is analyzing it at the bottom, then we'll draw a free body diagram at the bottom, and our coordinate system will say up is positive. If the question places the ball at the top of its circular motion, like a roller coaster at the top, then, well, acceleration is actually down, so we're going to make down positive. So that's how we're going to choose our coordinate system. But this isn't the only coordinate system. We can choose lots of coordinate systems. And let's say we have the Earth, and we have a satellite around Earth moving around the Earth in circular motion. And at this point, well, I'm going to choose this direction to be positive, because that's the direction of acceleration. Now, what forces are acting on it? Well, in this case, only gravity is acting on it, and it's in this direction. Okay, that's very, very important. You do not write centripetal force on a free body diagram. Because centripetal force, just like those three um, equations I wrote, one for x, one for y, and one for centripetal force, it's a net force. Okay, go back to the example of the ball on a string. where we have tension up and gravity down. Centripetal force is a sum of those forces. Both those forces contribute to centripetal force. Okay, obviously tension is contributing in a positive way and gravity in a negative way in this case, but they still both contribute. So you should never draw centripetal force on a free body diagram because it's a net force, which is a sum of the forces that you do draw on a free body diagram. Okay, let's go over a couple of other examples. Let's say you had a car on a road going in a horizontal cir circle, and then the road is flat. Okay, so um, here's your road, here's your car, okay? It's actually going in and out like this. So here are the red taillights. So we're looking at the car from behind. All right, so if it's going in and out like this, this would be our positive direction, because that's the direction of acceleration towards the center of the circle. Now, what force is actually, uh, or forces actually contributing to that? Now, if you want, you could put gravity, if you want, you could put gravity and the normal force on this diagram, but neither of those forces contribute to centripetal force because they're perpendicular to it, always. 
In this case, we actually have static friction. So the tires are on the road. We talked about this before. They're not sliding on the road. I mean, if you go in a circle too fast, then you will lose control and you will slide off on a tangent, in which case then it's kinetic friction. But assuming you are a safe driver and you don't drive really fast, which we will talk about later, um, then static friction has occurred. Now, there's actually two forces of friction here, right? You have static friction um, in the direction you're moving and perpendicular to it because you're moving in a, in a circle. So you have two directions of friction in this case. Okay, but I'm not going to write the other one. It would actually be into the, uh, the board. And it's also perpendicular to this one. So this is the only one I really care about right now. It's the only force contributing to centripetal force. Now what would happen if we banked the road? Because that's what usually happens when you drive in a circle. Imagine an on ramp to a highway, right? Those on ramps get you going in some form of circular motion and they bank you. Why do they do that? Well, let's look at this. Here, let's place a car here with no tires. Okay, and then it's doing the same thing. It's going into the board and out. Now, question, what direction should we make positive? Or put another way, what direction is the direction of centripetal acceleration? I'm going to give you two options. Is it option one? Is it option two? Take a moment to think about it. Pause the video if you want. Okay, this one's a little tricky. Your car is not sliding down this ramp. Okay, watch, watch my pen as it goes in and out. This is your circular motion. Notice it stays perfectly level with option number two. My pen does not do this. Okay, so in this case, acceleration is in this direction. So if we were drawing this free body diagram, even though up until now we've, we've uh, rotated our coordinate system, in this case, we're not going to because that is our direction of acceleration. So that changes a couple of things. One, gravity is perpendicular to that, so we don't need to write components of gravity. And this is the normal. And I'm actually going to say this is a frictionless surface. If it's a frictionless surface, can you still go in a circle? The answer is yes, if you're going the right speed. Okay, if you go too fast, you'll fly off the ramp. If you're going too slow, you'll slide down the ramp. But if you're going the right speed, the normal force is actually the one broken up into components. Okay, if you go the right speed, okay, then you can stay perfectly on track, so to speak. And it's this component, your x component, or I'll say your centripetal component of the normal force, which is providing that centripetal acceleration. Okay, um, let's do another example. A roller coaster. Say you have a roller coaster, and we go in a loop, so in the loop and then out of the loop. Let's say you're right at the top. Okay, well, what forces are being exerted? Well, if you're talking about you, you're sitting in your chair, your chair is actually pushing, in this case, down on you because you're upside down. So we have a normal force in this direction. And then of course we also have gravity in this direction. There's actually no upward force there. So what keeps you up there? Now on modern roller coasters you would have a lot of safety devices that would lock you in place and so if the roller coaster stopped upside down you wouldn't actually fall down. You'd just be really uncomfortable. <laughs> But assuming there's no safety devices in place, it would still work. Assuming they don't stop you at the top, then you fall straight down. But if you are going in a circle, it would still work. Why? What keeps you from falling down? It's actually almost kind of similar 
to what keeps objects in orbit. Okay, we kind of talked about this before, and I'll actually talk about it a little bit more again tomorrow, because we'll talk about gravitation again. But when you're in orbit, you maintain orbit because of your high horizontal velocity. And so technically you are always falling, but you're falling around the curvature. Now, if you look at this situation, you are going to fall. But if your speed is high enough, as you fall, you will move forward enough that you're still on the track. Right? And the track is always going to push you inwards in the direction of centripetal acceleration. And there's one question on the back that pretty much says, okay, well, what, what is that minimum speed you would need to actually go around the loop? Okay, well, if we're going to analyze that, let's look at forces. I'm just going to erase the bottom half of this loop here. Now, acceleration is down at this point, so I'm going to make down our positive direction. And I'm going to write sum of all centripetal forces equals mass times centripetal acceleration. The forces which make up centripetal force, in this case, are gravity and normal. So I'm going to write mg for gravity plus normal force which equals mass, and I'm going to change centripetal acceleration to v squared over r. Okay, now we want to know the minimum speed. Well, what happens if we go a little bit slower than the minimum speed? If we go slower than the minimum speed, we fall, don't we? We're no longer attached to the track, and if we don't have safety harnesses, we're no longer attached to the cart. So at that point, there's no more normal force. So the normal force is going to go to zero at the limit where our velocity approaches our minimum velocity. Okay, so in this equation, what we can do is we can set normal force equal to zero and say mg equals mv minimum squared over r. And again, the cool thing is that mass cancels. And that's very, very important. And you wouldn't want to have to go to a Wonderland or another amusement park with a roller coaster and, you know, instead of uh, your attendants, instead of saying, uh, do we have a group of two or a group of three, they start saying, do we have someone who weighs at least 90 kilograms, please? We need we need the cart to make sure it goes around the loop. That'd be terrifying if you heard somebody say that. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't get on. <laughs> okay, but that's not the case, because if we look at it, the minimum velocity is just related to gravity, which if we're building a roller coaster on the Earth, we can't control that, and the radius of the loop. Okay? And because of that, loops have evolved over the years. A hundred years ago, the loop that I just drew, which was a perfect circle, I didn't draw a perfect circle, but anyway, I tried to draw a perfect circle, would cause a lot of injuries, like neck injuries and things like that. Nowadays, a loop looks like this. It'll go up to the exact same height that other ones went to, but the minimum velocity is a lot less. Isn't that strange? They reach the exact same height but this one can go a lot slower in order to make it around. Why? Well, at any point, you can sort of imagine a circle around it. And so if you're at the top, you can sort of imagine a circle at that top with that radius. Whereas this one, you can imagine that you don't need to imagine a circle. It's there for you. And so the radius with that radius. I'm going to make this a big capital R. So this one, even though at the same height, has a much bigger radius. A much bigger radius means a much larger minimum velocity required. Much larger velocity to make it around the loop makes for some problems. Okay, so this is called a clothoid loop, and it's the only loop that you'll see now in uh, amusement parks because it's a lot safer. Okay. 
Now this strategy for solving problems is what we're going to use to solve the four problems on the back. I made another video where I actually go through each problem. It's a whiteboard animation video. Try it yourself first, right? And then watch the other video. Okay, and our next lesson will be the last lesson for this unit, and we're going to go over universal gravitation.